It is great to welcome to the program today Congressman Richie Torres, who has represented New York's 15th congressional district in the Bronx since 2021. He's on the House Financial Services Committee, also the Select Committee on Strategic Competition between the US and China. Uh, it's so great to have you on. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat a little bit. Happy to be here. So maybe to start with, I'm interested in your perspective right now on the progressive movement. And the reason I want to talk to you about this is I see you really when people ask me, who do you see right now as the sort of progressive that you like to be at the head of this movement going forward? I think of you and there's a bunch of different reasons why. And unfortunately, there is right now a bit of a division as I see it on the left on a number of issues that includes foreign policy. Certainly the Israeli Gaza situation has brought this into the forefront for a lot of people, even on things like tax policy and whether we should be pursuing something in the style of northern Europe as opposed to further left ideas is a subject of contention. So I'm curious as someone who I consider to be part of this movement, I believe you consider yourself part part of this movement, but there are some rifts. What direction do you want to see the left of the Democratic Party take over the next five to 10 years? You know, before speaking about the divide within the progressive movement, I think, you know, it's worth reflecting on the success of the movement. You know, yes. the Democratic Party is more progressive today than it's ever been. Uh, all but one congressional Democrat is pro choice. Every congressional Democrat has been a sponsor of the Equality Act, which would codify LGBTQ equality in federal law. And the fact that, you know, a historically centrist political figure like Joe Biden has had the most progressive presidency in recent history is a testament to the success and to the strength of the progressive movement. Uh, and the legislation speaks for itself, whether it's the Inflation Reduction Act, we came extraordinarily close to passing the Build Back Better Act, uh, only to be obstructed not only by the Republicans, but by the likes of Kirsten Sinema and, and Joe Manchin. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the fact that the Democratic Party um, is, is fundamentally progressive is a triumph of the progressive movement. Having said that, having said all that, I do worry about the, the, the radicalization of, of progressivism. And there is a real danger of the progressive movement representing the views of, to be blunt, a largely white college educated elite, rather than the views and sensibilities of everyday people of color who make up the heart of the Democratic Party. Uh, and so one example is, is defunding the police. You know, I'm, I'm in favor of police reform. Uh, there's a real need to bring greater transparency and accountability to policing. There's a real need to either abolish or maybe even a, a, a reform qualified immunity. Uh, those are historically progressive positions. Yes. But there's an organization in New York City, the New York City Democratic Socialists of America, that advocates or has advocated for defunding the NYPD, the New York City Police Department, by 50 percent. Right. You know, as far as I'm concerned, taking a machete to government agencies and defunding them is something Republicans do. But if you ask everyday people of color, do you want policing to be defunded by 50 percent? The answer would be overwhelmingly no. And so why are we advancing an agenda that is fundamentally unreflected and unrepresentative of working class people of color in places like the South Bronx? And, and that's my greatest critique of what the progressive movement is increasingly becoming. You know, it's so interesting you mentioned that when th this idea of let's go to the stakeholders and see what they believe and what they want. You know, a, a very different but related in a way. I'm from Argentina. I consider myself Hispanic by the U.S. Census. I'm Hispanic. I'm also Jewish, by the way, which I consider to be an extreme minority, which unfortunately there are some who say, no, 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 that's not a minority group. But to focus on the Hispanic part for a second, this Latin X thing, which yep. it, it doesn't ring true to me in any way. It doesn't represent or in any way bolster the richness of my background or for Hispanic Americans. I don't know any actual Latino or Hispanic folks for whom that resonates. And it feels like one of these things you're alluded to that's imposed 
by a sliver of what currently claims to be the left. Well, I have no issue with the term per se, right? Like if if you if if you're a person of trans experience and want me to refer to you as Latinx, I will respect that. Mm. Because that's just basic common courtesy. Sure. Here's the issue I have. We have Pew Research revealed that the majority of La many Latinos have not even heard of the term, and many of them are offended. And if we know that the majority of the Latino community either identifies as Latino or Hispanic, then why has Latinx become the default term yes. in corporate America and in politics? So that's the issue I have. It's not the term itself. But but we are imposing a label on a community that never uses the term, and 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 I and again I think it's an example of speaking for communities of color without actually speaking to them, and that to me is the Achilles heel of of the progressive movement. Now I don't want to just be negative because we've been talking about some things that we disagree with. I also find personally, in my experience, that while some of these slices of the progressive movement are loud, I don't think they're anywhere close to a majority or a plurality. I think that in certain spaces they are getting a lot of attention. But as you said at the beginning of the interview, I actually think the left is mostly united around ninety nine percent of this stuff with disagreements around the fringes, recognizing the importance of denying, for example, Donald Trump four more years as president recognizing the disaster that Trump 2016 has been on Roe v. Wade and connecting the dots all the way to last year. I I am mostly positive in the united nature of the progressive movement. Are, are you in agreement with that? I might have a more nuanced view. So I agree okay. that I actually agree that the left is united. And and we we uni we're united on most issues and we see Donald Trump as an existential threat to our democracy who needs to be defeated. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it is worth pointing out that, you know, the free Palestine protesters are not disrupting Republican events. They're disrupting Democratic events. Mm. They're not targeting Donald Trump. They're targeting Joe Biden, knowing that it could work to the advantage of Donald Trump. And look, my view is if you and I agree on only one percent of the issues, we should collaborate one percent of the time. Obviously, if we agree on ninety nine percent of the issues, we should collaborate ninety nine percent of the time. But it's no longer that simple. Um, I worry that politics has become religiosity without religion. You know, there are people who think if you disagree with me, that you're not merely wrong, but you're evil, and you should. In other words, there's a dogma and these sort of litmus tests. There's a dogmatism. Yeah. So and, and so dogmatism, even on one percent of the issues, could actually prevent us from collaborating on ninety nine percent of the remaining issues. That's the concern that I have. That really gets to my main concern with the attacks on Biden over Israel, Gaza, which is that we risk either. I mean, depending on whether you believe Robert F. Kennedy does or doesn't have a chance, I don't think he does. But even if we grant that maybe he does both Kennedy and Trump by the standards being imposed on Biden by these folks would be worse. And it seems to me like a classic missing the forest for the trees or throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And I feel like there's a need for pragmatism. And, you know, we're playing Russian roulette like I look, I, I'm optimistic about the house, but it's more competitive than people think. Yeah, there is a much greater risk of complete Republican control of the federal government than people realize. And we have to stop playing Russian roulette. We have to coalesce around Biden and do everything we can to defeat Trump, to hold on to the Senate and to win the House, which could be our last hope for preventing complete Republican control of the federal government. Congressman, can you give us a sense of the conversation that's happening in the House right now? Because, as you say, the, the, the next uh, Congress is not guaranteed to be a Democratic in the House. We just don't know that right now. We saw a wing of the Republican Party kick out Kevin McCarthy. Uh, we now see some of your colleagues on the Republican side increasingly upset with MAGA Mike Johnson, although he went down to Mar-a-Lago and there's sort of this show being made about everybody super united. But it's not obvious to me that they are to the extent that you can tell us about some of the conversations that are happening. Is it possible that they're going to get rid of the current speaker of the House as well? It's, it's certainly possible. I mean, I mean, the the, the House Republicans vacated a, their own speaker for the first time in American history. 
you know, if 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 the House Republican Conference were a country, it would be a failed state. You have all the elements of a failed state. You have dysfunction, incompetence, and extremism. You have a coup d'etat. You have a civil war. Um, I mean, I've seen a level of dysfunction that I never thought I could imagine. I mean, in my in my you know in my first term, uh, you know, if if someone had said to me, Richie, you're going to become a member of Congress during a global pandemic and witness an insurrection against the U.S. Capitol and then vote to impeach the host of The Celebrity Apprentice. I would have said that sounds more like a movie, but the second term, you know, we went from the longest speaker vote in more than 150 years to a near default on the nation's debt, to a near shutdown of the government. Uh, and it's just been nothing to the first ever vacate of a speaker. It, it's been nothing but dysfunction. So, um, you know, Mike Johnson feels he's in danger of losing his speakership, especially if he brings the national security supplemental to the floor. You've spoken about uh, your struggles with mental health over the years, and this is a important issue to me, not just because so much of my family works in mental health, but because it is an area that has a stigma attached to it. It's an area that I don't believe is properly dealt with by the insurance plans, health insurance plans that most people have in different ways and for different reasons. And also because to the extent that some in the Republican Party pay lip service to the idea of this as an issue, whether it's as it conveniently relates to firearms or in other ways, there doesn't seem to be a big enthusiasm from your Republican colleagues to really do what needs to be done in terms of funding and destigmatizing what's going on with with mental health. So can you talk a little bit about it can be broader, it can be narrow, the sorts of things you'd like to see done on the issue of mental health. Well, I agree with you that Republicans only seem to bring up mental health in an attempt to distract away from the epidemic of gun violence. Um, for me, mental health is core to who I am. But, you know, more than 15 years ago, I actually was at the lowest point in my life. I had dropped out of college, found myself struggling with depression, abusing substances. I even attempted suicide and underwent hospitalization because I felt as if the world around me had collapsed. Mm. And seven years later, you know, I rebuilt my life and became the youngest elected official in New York City, in America's largest city. And, and today I'm a United States congressman. And I often tell people, you know, I would not be in Congress. I would not be alive were it not for the power of mental health care uh, and the impact it had in saving my life. Uh, and so I'm a huge proponent of expanding access to mental health care. Um, you know, in the Bronx, I secured about $8 million to expand the largest network of school-based health centers uh, in, in the United States. Because um, I had asked, you know, when I was in high school beginning to struggle with depression, I had no vocabulary for what I was experiencing. I thought I was experiencing a failure of willpower. Right. I, I, th I thought the problem was me. And, you know, I went to a chronically under-resourced school that had no psychologists, no social workers, no psychiatrists. And so I often ask myself, if I had had access to a school-based mental health center, to on-site psychologists and psychiatrists, then maybe all the crises that followed would have been prevented. There's the kind of resource and funding and access side. I'm also curious your thoughts on the cultural side to this, because there's a lot of cultural stuff wrapped up in the idea of mental health struggles being indicative of a sort of constitutional weakness that a broken arm maybe does not have attached to it in some jobs or professions. Seeking out that type of care comes with the question of can you really handle this job in a way that a sprained ankle or diabetes doesn't? So what do you think needs to happen culturally? Look, I, I have set out to change the culture surrounding mental health in America. You know, I tell my story in the hopes of breaking the silence and shame and stigma that often surrounds the subject of mental health. Um, and I tell people that mental illness like depression is not a failure of character or willpower. It is a disease that has to be managed with treatment, with care, with a combination of medication management and psychotherapy. You know, blaming someone for depression is like blaming, blaming someone for the inability to generate insulin. Um, and, and so I do feel like there's growing awareness that is breaking the stigma of mental health. Yes. Uh, a few months ago, I was one of four members of Congress who participated in an interview with ABC. We were all sharing our struggles with mental health. And, and I said, you know, the fact that all of us are speaking so openly 
is a sign of how far we've come. But the fact that it's only four members of Congress out of 535, it shows that we have a distance to travel before achieving a, a society that truly embraces mental health. And it's more important than ever because I feel that the, the isolation of COVID-19 and social media have been complete catastrophes for the mental health of the next generation. Yeah, and statistically, there's more than just three of your colleagues that are or have struggled with this no stuff. Question. I mean, it just no question about it. Uh, we've been speaking with Democratic Congressman Richie Torres representing New York's 15th congressional district. Congressman, I really appreciate your time today and uh, uh, keep up the great work. Absolutely. Take care.